So, forgive me, because I finished these slides um, an hour and a half ago. Okay. And I haven't really had time to look them over yet. But we're doing apologetics level three today, and a seventh of apologetics level four. Okay? It's much shorter than you think. All right. So what we're going to go over in level three is apostolic versus non Apostolic apologetics. So basically, the apostolic churches are identified by um, apostolic succession, which means that for each of our bishops, you can you can trace them back to Jesus Christ through the bishop that ordained them. So like uh, uh, Bish Bishop Gurulus, okay, we can identify who ordained him. And then that bishop, we can uh, identify who ordained him and who ordained him and who ordained him. And we can go all the way up the line to uh, Jesus. And that includes the Orthodox and Catholic churches. Uh, okay, so the Protestant, non-denominational, Anglican, Lutheran, Baptist, those ones are all, all non-apostolic. Anything past the schism where uh, the, the Protestants split off from the Catholics, the Protestant church, and anything after, they're all non-apostolic. And then this section, we're going to show why our apostolic church is the only church to provide like a solution to the fall of man. So our, here, I have a, I have a thing. Basically, this is how the this is how the apologetics breaks down. So, level one, we're proving the existence of God, and then level two, we're providing a defense for Christianity. Level three, which is one we're doing today, we'll talk about apostolic stuff, and then our sacraments that that all tie everything together. Oh wait, that doesn't close it. Never mind. Okay. So, in the beginning, man was created in the image of likeness of God and likeness of God. Okay. So, on the image side, we were created or we were made in the image of like the Trinity. Because if you read the actual verse, it says God God said, "Let us make man in our image." So that very clearly points to to the Trinity, and then. There's also the eternal image because we all have everlasting life. And then in his likeness, we're made like loving and giving and all these other uh, things. So we were also created to have dominion over all creation. Okay, We are the apex predator. And that was only given to us by God. Okay, So God is still up there. And we're down there still, okay? And then we were also created to be united. So we see that with Adam and Eve, uh, our sacrament of matrimony. And we were given a command to multiply. And we were also, through this, given joy because we're all not alone. Adam was not just a lone dude in the whole world. So the result of the fall thing we all love. Death came into the world. Death is an enemy of man. And when death entered, man was separated from God. Man became corrupted. And then God prevented Adam and Eve from the tree of life. So this sort of just pulled us further and further apart. So basically it prevented us from having communion with God. Okay. So Adam and Eve, they had full access to God. They fell, and then they're prevented from accessing God. Okay, so this is the main problem of the fall. Therefore, we need a solution. And the solution must result in us again gaining access to God. And it, it's... So the fall is almost like a liturgy that was broken up by us. Because if you think about it, liturgy, we go, we partake of the body and blood of Christ. And then when we fell, we 
Wait, how do I explain this? Okay. Basically, tree of life, that's communion. When we go take communion, we also partake of the tree of life. Okay? And then that, that, that liturgy almost was broken up because we're not allowed to partake of the tree of life anymore until Jesus came. And then we'll talk about that in a few seconds. But, uh, yeah, liturgy is the main way of uh, solving the fall. And that all appears in the New Testament. So, okay, this chart over here is kind of confusing. I understand. Basically, it's like beginning and then the fall and then God's plan, okay? All right, so God doesn't like us to have death. He doesn't like us being dead. He doesn't like, geez, see, this is what happens when you make slides an hour before coming here. Okay, okay, forgive me. Basically, God doesn't like the stuff that resulted from the fall, okay? And God's love is so abundant that he doesn't want us to, to just die and that be it. So he gives us eternal life. He doesn't want us to have like corruption in our nature. Uh, he doesn't want us to be separated from him. And he also, even though Adam and Eve like directly went against what he said, he made them, he made them their tunics. Okay. So there's a preparation and fulfillment of the salvation plan. This is seen by the preparation being in the Old Testament and the fulfillment being in the New Testament. And we'll break that down in the slides to come. Uh, St. Paul calls the preparation stuff the shadow of the real things. So I, I don't know if they're going to like ask you for a definition on that or anything. But Okay, so there's four steps to this solution. God calls us, his children, back to be in his congregation. He establishes a place of worship, and then he institutes a system of worship. And then through those first three steps, we are led to eternal life. Okay, so the fourth step is only fulfilled in the New Testament. And the, the first three steps are... Like, in the New Testament, they're regarded as real heavenly worship. And then the Old, the Old Testament, those three things are all just, like, symbols of what's to come. They haven't, they're just there. They haven't been fulfilled yet. Am I going too fast? Is there... Okay. The one, the one person taking notes says I'm going too fast. Actually, there's two. Good? Okay. Oh, wait, did I? Okay. So, first, Old Testament solution to the fall, the congregation. So, this is just going to go over what the congregation was in the Old Testament, okay? So, we start with Abraham. He's called to leave his land and follow God to a new land with his sons, okay? Then Abraham dies, Isaac takes over, and then uh, Jacob comes in. And he has 12 sons, and those 12 sons are the leaders of the 12 tribes of Judah. Okay? And then they fall into captivity un under the Egyptians. They escape with Moses, and then the tabernacle is built. And then the judges come about, and they're rulers over the congregation with God-given instruction. The kings basically came because the congregation was like, hey, everybody else has a king. We want a king too. So they established kings. So they got Saul, and then David, and then Solomon. And Jerusalem during uh, King David's time was established as the city of the king. And then Solomon, we all love Solomon. He built the temple in Jerusalem in the center of the land. And then later on, our kingdom, the kingdom divides. Our congregation gets split up and captive by a bunch of different 
nations, and then that is when most of the prophets come about during that uh, era. And then our return to the land is with Ezra, Hag Haggai, and Nehemiah. So what Ezra did was basically uh, sort of reinstate the Torah. So like he kind of faded out, but then he kind of like brought it back in. And then Hag Haggai uh, tried to rally people in to come and help rebuild the temple. And Nehemiah came in and finished the job of like building up Jerusalem again. And then the Greeks took the Jews captive and then there was a Maccabean revolt that freed them and then the temple was dedicated. So that's the history of the congregation in the Old Testament. So the house that was established for worship. Basically, this is their tabernacle. Okay, It's an on-the-go tent thing that they used and brought everywhere with them when they were doing their 40 years in the desert. Okay, basically, there's the entrance. It's at the east. Notice the altar is at the east. I think that's pretty cool. Okay, so up there, there's the altar of the burnt offerings, and then there's the la lava or, or something. And then here's the door to the temple. There's a, there's a menorah here, altar of incense, and then the table of shrew bread. And then here is a veil. So no one could go through this veil except for priests. And that kind of shows like the separation from God that they had at that time. No one's allowed to go in there. And then back here is the Ark of the Covenant. And that's basically like the holiest thing on that ground. All right, the rituals of the Old Testament. Basically, they had this whole thing, like man cannot dare to approach God. And that's reflected in all these rituals, okay? So all of this is from Leviticus, chapters 1 through 7. And there's six, six offerings. There's a burnt offering, which symbolizes Christ on the cross. And then there's a grain offering, which is not, it's not offered with an animal. And that symbolizes Christ during his pure life. There's the sin offering, and that sort of reflects Christ as a carrier of sin when he became a curse for us on the cross and then got rid of all our sins. And then there's a trespass offering in which Christ paid our ransom. And then there's a peace offering where Christ sort of establishes the Eucharist in the New Testament. And there's uh, two goals to the uh, animal sacrifices, okay? So there's redemption, in which an innocent dies on behalf of a guilty so that the guilty is spared from death. I don't know about you, but that sounds a lot like Jesus, but with an animal. So, the shedding of blood is also, like, oh. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. Shedding of blood is the death of the innocent. So, I, I, don't, I don't know what that means. It should. <laughs> okay. Then, we have the priesthood, which is established by Aaron. Uh, we have a bunch of rules about uh, clean and unclean animals in uh, Leviticus 11, and like it, I was reading it earlier, and it's 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 pretty weird. Like you couldn't eat animals with a cloven hoof, so it's like if they have like two toes or something, you can't eat those. And then you can only eat grasshoppers, but not anything, any other bugs. It's like it, it's so specific to random things, but yeah. There's rules on the cleanliness of the male and female body. Uh, there's something called the Great Atonement Day. And then they talk about blood and feasts and stuff. So if you want to look into that later, please do. Switch. There. 
Yeah. So how these rituals work was at the fall, holiness was lost, and then we were separated from God, and then we must be sanctified. Okay. So that's basically the framework of why they were doing all these rituals. And many of these rituals and rules, like the stuff about animal eating, has to do with instilling like an automatic avoidance within everyone of anything that's unholy. So it's like if you were to name something, they could be like unholy. Yeah. All right. New Testament. What's our problem? Man is corrupted by death. Man's corruption prevents him from the tree of life. Okay? So, God doesn't like that. He's like, watch this. So, the solution that God has to give, it has to remove our corruption, and it has to give us that access to God again. So, God's solution was the cross and the resurrection. Okay? So, Christ overcame death by his death, and then resurrected and that gave us the power over death, okay? And then our solution, which was given by God through uh, the cross and the resurrection, is a remission of sins, so it's a removal of corruption, okay? And then the Eucharist, which is eating from the tree of life. And that, that like, directly solves our whole problem there. Okay. Congregation in the New Testament. Everyone's allowed in. It's not just priests that can go in and be next to the Ark of the Co Covenant. So in the Old Testament, only priests could enter the tabernacle. And then in the New Testament, all of us become our own temples of God through baptism and chrismation. Because, you know, the tabernacle was seen as a place like that God was. And then if we have the Holy Spirit, then we have God inside of us, thereby you are a temple. Yes. So he was asking um, when you said that everyone was allowed in, what about the girls? She was asking if the girls were allowed. Okay. Specifically the altar? No. But you are still regarded as a temple of God. Because you are baptized, right? Yeah. And you're chrismated? The, yes, you are. <laughs> it's just chrismation is something they do like after they dunk the baby. They get the maroon oil. They put a bunch of crosses on you. And then that's like when the Holy Spirit comes down and dwells inside of you. So yeah. <laughs> Actually... When we get to the baptism section, I will demonstrate how I was baptized. Okay. So, basically, through this, we received holiness, where baptism replaced uh, circumcision, and then sanctification by the Holy Spirit during chrismation. Okay. So, the house that Christ established. Okay, communion was established, as we all know, at the Last Supper. So we gain access to the tree of life again. Yay. Yeah. Wahoo. Uh, this is just a verse talking about uh, the Last Supper. And then, on the seventh day, God rested. He took time to show love to Adam and Eve. And so, to return the favor, we go in. And we show love to God on that seventh day. Yes. What is definition of day? Okay. So day, technically, I, I think it's... In, in the context of creation, day is like long, long periods of time. You know? I, there, there's, so, there's someone that can give... Isn't he your uncle, Henry Awad? Yeah, talk to your uncle about that. Get him to come here and answer that question. I said a wad. You said a wad. It's a wad. It's a wad. It's all it, That's the same thing. Come on. That is basically the same thing. Okay, so the rituals that were established as a result. Okay. 
Um, I couldn't summarize this because Abuna put it very well, so I'm just going to read it. What is emphasized here is that the book of Revelation is showing us elements of the liturgy, which means that God, when he wanted to per, per, portray his abode with man and show us his glory, it was shown as scenes from the liturgy, which means that Christians are celebrating liturgies on earth and therefore will be familiar with these visions as they are portrayed to St. John and sent to all the churches. So here are all the elements of the liturgy seen in Revelation. There's the Lamb and the Tree of Life in Revelations 5 and 22. The veil is open and we see the altar, which is the throne of God in Revelations 4. Uh, the four incorporeal creatures, four evangelists, parallelism there in Revelations 4. Uh, the souls under the altar, that's in Revelations 5. Worshiping in white, that's Revelations 5. And the singing antiphonically, that's Revelation 1, 4, and 5. I think that's, that's when we switch sides, right? When we're singing? Christian? Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. Faith and works. Non-apostolic churches, Protestants, Anglicans, Baptists. Okay? So they believe that, well, the thing said Protestants specifically, but I'll group them together. So, non-apostolic churches believe that faith in God alone will save you. No. So, we believe that one has to have faith and do works. Okay, what are these works? So, there's a difference between works and what's referenced a lot in the Bible as works of the law. Okay? So, works of the law means more like rituals of the law. Okay? So, St. Paul writes, don't do the works of the law because they've disappeared and they're irrelevant, okay? If we were to disregard all the works of the law, so like all five books of the law, then we wouldn't have to obey the Ten Commandments. But we do. Why is that? Because the law is spiritual. The law that St. Paul is refer referencing is spiritual, okay? So we still have a, like internal, I don't know, obligation to do, like, follow out, or, no, carry out those Ten Commandments. Uh, yeah. So works basically, like, ministering, feeding the poor, that, that sort of stuff. Ooh. I did not hit the icon. Okay, so... Significance of do this in remembrance of me. We're all familiar with this line. We hear it a bunch of times every Sunday. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare a standard Jewish dinner to the Last Supper, and then we'll see how Christ made it different. Yeah, so the Last Supper goes off of the uh, framework of what's called the Ch Charbura dinner. Okay, it's basically just like a small meeting of friends. So they were held weekly on the eve of Sabbath, Sabbath or the holy or a holy day. <clears throat> There's food that's blessed. Hands are washed. Then they bless the bread. Then they ate. Then they wash their hands again. <clears throat> and then they say a blessing after they ate. And then on special occasions, a cup of wine would be passed around and sipped by all members that were there. Okay? So, basically, these last two points of they said a blessing after they ate. In, in the Bible, it says that they gave thanks, and then Christ said, or Christ passed around that cup of wine and then said, this is my blood, do this in remembrance of me. No, that didn't switch. Okay. So do this does not mean that Christ was instituting a whole new like rite that we have to do or a whole new tradition that we have to do. Basically, he took that dinner and then he made it his own. Okay. So he assigned a whole new meaning to the meal. Whenever disciples uh, would have that meal, which was like fairly regularly, it would have a whole new meaning to them than the traditional Jewish uh, standard. 
and that made it not just like another dinner with your buds yeah an important note is the meal was completely like normal to all of them okay there there was no structural changes or anything but uh when christ was passing that cup of wine after supper he said this cup is the new covenant no what Blah. this cup is the new covenant covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me okay basically C completely new new meaning okay that cup of wine is now not just that ceremonial cup of wine it is now the blood of Christ and they didn't really know what that meant fully so it, w it was a new and peculiar meaning to them okay yeah am I going too fast or I okay the lobs the lobs. You don't know what lobs means. Basically, in Tezbeha, we have the four canticles, and then we have the four lobs for those canticles. Okay? So, like, first canticle, we talk about how the Red Sea was split, and Moses and the children of Israel, like, got through the Red Sea, right? And then, the lobs, we sing a song, and it's an explanation of the canticle. So, lobs is just another word for explanation. This is the now. This is the explanation. Okay, our church, our apostolic church, offers a solution to the fall. We have confession and the Eucharist. We receive th those from Christ dying on the cross and rising from the dead, and then the New Testament fulfills God's whole plan for salvation. Okay, so we're called to Him as a congregation. We've established a house of worship. We've established our rites of worship, and then through those three things we can once again take from the tree of life and have eternal life. Yeah. We're not saved by faith alone, but also by the carrying out of the duties we are given as Christians. Okay, so loving your enemies, stuff like that. And then Christ gave, gave a new meaning to the Chabora dinner. It was carried out the exact same way, but he completely flipped the meaning. Yeah. Okay, so the level four intro. Here, we're going to discuss sacraments, okay? Instituted by Christ himself. And for all of this, there's going to be a reference in the Bible somewhere, but there's like too many to put in. So, yeah. Okay, so we'll use the sacraments to help provide a defense for like the Orthodox Church. The apostolic stuff covers... Like, oh yeah, apostolic churches are, uh, you know, right about this, this, and this. But that includes the Catholic and Orthodox. This narrows it down to just, like, Orthodox, okay? So, sacrament literally means a mystery, okay? It's a way that God gives grace to his people. And then we have seven sacraments. Who can name them all? Go. Marriage, uh, baptism. Five, four, uh, three, dose, uno. Uh huh. Okay, Max. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> sneaky, sneaky child. You should know them anyway. Everyone should know them. Baptism, chrismation, the Eucharist, confession, the priesthood, marriage, and the unction of the sick. Okay. So, I, yeah. What? No, okay, the myrun is what's put on you during the process of chrismation. It's a holy oil that we that Abuna anoints you with. Yes? So the sacrament of baptism, okay? What's the purpose of baptism? We've removed the consequences of the fall. 
We die with Christ and you resurrect with him, okay? You, you get rid of all your sins. And then you become like a, a whole new creation. And then it unites the person with the body of Christ and it opens the door to salvation and eternal life. Does anybody know what the body of Christ is? Body of Christ. Wow, Max. No. 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 Uh uh. It's a very simple word that starts with a C and ends in herch. Yes. <laughs> the body of Christ is the church, okay? So. Christ talks of baptism a bunch of times. Uh, and then for our like actual ceremony, what we do is we do what's called the water liturgy, where we sanctify the water with prayers and the maroon. And then we turn to the west, and we uh, raise our right hand, and we say, I renounce you, Satan. I renounce you, Satan. I renounce you, Satan. Okay? That is uh, like an exorcism part. You know, we, we say, no Satan. And then we turn towards the east, turns towards the altar, and we say, and then we accept Christ, okay? So, for our baptisms, we do three immersions in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, okay? Then we wrap the person in white clothes and a red ribbon. So the ribbon symbolizes the blood of Christ that we're saved by, and it also represents, like, uh... The weapons we're given, the, the, we're armed with the passions of Christ. Okay? And then rarely, very rarely, I haven't seen this happen, but they place a crown on the person's head to represent like, them belonging to the heavens and their victory over death. Okay. There's a lot of questions surrounding baptism from other churches. One of them is why we baptize by immersion uh, by immersion, and we do that three times. So basically, three times, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, okay? That one's simple enough. And then for full immersion, it's like we are buried and raised with Christ, okay? So you go all the way down, then you come all the way back up three times. Yes? Yeah. No, I, I'm like 90% sure that the priest like puts them in. <laughs> They're sitting in there and they just lean back, Max. Yes. I I don't I don't think they're like. No. No 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 Jacob, no. Okay. They are, Basically, you guys want to hear a really funny story about how I almost died during my baptism? Yeah. Basically, 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 Abuna comes, he grabs me like a, like a chicken, okay? He has my legs in one hand and my hands in the other. So you're flailing. Huh? They're flailing around. No, I wasn't flailing. He, I couldn't flail. How was I? Okay. So basically, he gets me, and then he goes, in the name of the Father, and there's like bubbles in the water, okay? In the name of the Father, okay? I'm up, in the name of the Son, I'm up, and then I go down on the third one, and the Holy Spirit, there's no bubbles. The baby has stopped breathing, and then I come up, and there's dead silence, and my aunt is freaking out, and then finally I cry, and no one's scared anymore. What? You, you slept through baptism. That okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, all, all right, buddy. Yes, Sophia. You want to? Funny enough, it was. Uh, no, he's he's an archdeacon. He's not a priest, but it it was uh, Ambassadorian before he was Metropolitan. So he was just a bishop. No, not a Muna. But yeah, it yeah, it was it it was 
That that's interesting. Huh? Yeah, he, he was Bishop Serapian before he was the Metro. Why does everyone laugh when I call him Metro? Okay. So, guys, why do we have infant baptism? Basically, it's concern for the eternal life of children. Okay. Basically, we give them an opportunity to partake of these of the sacraments of the church. And then the people that deny infant baptism, okay, so like uh, the Catholic Church is one of them that does this, but they deny the necessity of baptism for salvation because if, if you don't think that your baby should be baptized, then it's like you don't think your baby should be like available for salvation? That's kind of weird. Okay. And the Bible also many times mentions households being baptized. And, you know, if you say households, there has to, there has to be children. There's a bunch of, uh, I forget who it was, but someone g gave Christ a purple cloth. And then uh, someone said to her that her household would be baptized, okay? I'm not going to assume that in Jewish society, where like you, it was very, very encouraged to have kids, that this woman and her husband were the only ones being baptized. Okay? And that, that, like examples like that happen a bunch of times throughout the gospel. So people also ask, how did the thief on the right get saved without baptism? In baptism, we die and are resurrected with Christ, okay? This man literally died with Christ. So it's like the same thing. And like this same principle applies to martyrs who weren't baptized, okay? Like that one martyr we had uh, for the 21 martyrs of Libya, there was one guy that wasn't like Coptic, but he said uh, before they killed him, he was like, Whoever their God is like, what, what did he say? It was like something like, whoever their God is, I'm with them. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, that's where the slides end. So, now, questions? Yeah. The review is Friday. I'll post these when I. <clears throat> I'll post these when I get home today. Oh yeah 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 yeah. Cause I I just made this today so, yeah okay. Now, are there any questions? Why Google Classroom? No what? The Google Classroom. Isaiah, can you get the code to them? <laughs> Where'd you get that photo? <laughs> he, you know how I like to Mikhail people? Where I just take a photo of myself on their phone and leave it? I don't know how he has one. I, I don't remember Mikhailing you. I would have remembered opening up an iPad and Mikhailing you. Google class. Oh, when Jacob sent. Hey, go go to the code. Go to the code. Okay, hold on. Uh, who know? Who knows how to stop the recording? Someone, David, you don't know? Wow, wow. Okay, there should be a big button that says stop recording. Okay. Look at the board thing in front of you. Maybe it's there. there there's like a board in front of the keyboard. The, yeah, 